John chapter 8, John chapter 8, um, John chapter 8, uh, do not close your Bibles, uh, it's going to be one of those sermons where um, we're going to be bouncing around the, old, the New Testament, uh, last week we were bouncing around the Old Testament, not even last week, just Sunday it was, um, anybody remember what I preached on on Sunday? Miracles, okay. keys to miracles. What book? Joshua 3 and 4. That is correct. Amen. Amen. I want to speak to you about freedom today, uh, Black History Month. Um, free from slaves are free, and so, you know. Black history is always associated with some kind of slavery. And so anyways, I want to uh, witness and, and rather preach and minister to you on the issue of freedom. Uh, it's a very important and crucial issue. And so we're in John chapter 8 in the word of God. We're going to read one portion of scripture. And um, John chapter 8 verse 11. Um, so let's read. The Bible says, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for freedom. We thank you for your word. Help us, God, to have a big picture perspective on freedom. Show us your intention of what, what, what it is that you want us to do with the freedom that you provide. I pray you anoint this message in Jesus' name. And so one of the main selling points, if you may, I, I know it's wrong to say we sell the gospel, but one of the main selling points or reasons why Christians love the Lord or reasons why Christians love being Christians is the tremendous freedom that we find in following Jesus. Can you say amen? There is tremendous freedom. There's freedom like Nowhere else, we find freedom. Our souls are free. Our minds is free to think clear and think correct. We're free a lot of the times from making detrimental decisions, decisions that will destroy our lives. We're free to live for God. We're free to have healthy relationships. It's interesting. You know, I've been around people that say, man, how are you so comfortable with allowing people into your house? Aren't Aren't you afraid that someone's going to rob you? Aren't you afraid? And it, it's actually happened to me and my wife before. Uh, aren't you afraid? We, we, we had this couple over. I had, to, I had to stop and share the story. We had this couple over at our house for breakfast. Uh, we we're kind of disciple, trying to disciple them and trying to work with them. Uh, and so here they are. They want to serve God. They don't want to serve God. I don't know. Uh, who knows what they wanted. And so, you know, we just take people for their word. Uh, and we try to help them live for Jesus. Amen. And, and so here they are. Uh, we, we, it was morning. I think it was a Saturday afternoon around 11, 12. And uh, we we said, hey, come over for breakfast. Here they, we're sitting at my table. We're we're chilling. We're hanging out. The girl goes, I got to use the bathroom. And so the bathroom was upstairs. She goes upstairs. Literally twenty to thirty minutes later, she comes back like nothing. A few days later, my wife's shoes was missing. What was missing, babes? Your belt. Oh my goodness. So anyways, there's freedom in our Christian life. Can you say amen? I don't have that fear that someone's going to rob me. Amen. Uh, and so there is so much freedom that you and I as Gentiles experience in Christ Jesus. Just think of your own testimony. Think of your own life. Uh, all the freedom that you personally experience. Uh, all the blessings that you personally experience uh, in being and having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I want to kind of really bring this, okay, so, so now that it's applicable to us, I want to I wanna go back 2,000 years to Bible days, and I want you to picture with me a Jewish man in Bible days in his mid-20s, his mid-30s, uh, his entire life is centered around the law and the prophets. 
His entire life is centered around Moses and the prophets uh, and all that's in the Old Testament. You know, unlike in Christianity where we can we have a separation between church and state, uh, that's not how Judaism works. Uh, uh, there is no separation between church and state. Uh, there's no separation from church and work. Uh, there is no separation at all. Uh, in fact, the law and their religious values infiltrated their homes. Uh, it infiltrated their workplaces infiltrated their businesses it was Moses and the prophets every single where you turned for this mid 30 or mid 20 year old Jewish man this is how they lived their lives it was all everywhere they turned it was the Moses and the prophets the law had a way to be applicated uh, to be applicable in every single situation every single scenario in life uh, was the law this is how they lived their lives now now think about this same individual he is now confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, which we know that in, in a symbolic sense breaks the chains of bondage from the law that plagued that individual's life. And so you got to think about how powerful this is. It's not as simple as you and I see it. He wasn't just following a list of rules. He was literally in bondage to the law. It had a infiltrated, as I said, every single aspect of his life. And now here comes the gospel of Jesus Christ that says, I'm going to set you free from that law. You're going to enter into an era of grace. You're going to enter into relationship with me. I'm the one that's fulfilled the law. I'm the one that paid for your sins. You no longer need to be bound by all of these things that the law says. But now what you got to do is follow me and love me and live a life of sacrifice towards me. And that's Christianity. And this man is now set free. And so think about the freedom, how deep it was for the early Jewish Christians. And that's so much, so much, friends, that you and I read of regarding to freedom. It's speaking to someone in that context. It's speaking to Jewish believers. Now, here's the thing. L l listen to this, rather. Galatians, 1, Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ Jesus has freed you, and do not be entangled again. With a yoke of bondage. So the apostle Paul is speaking to believers in the churches in Galatia. And he's saying do not enter again into that mindset of thinking that you are somehow working your way to heaven. This is what he's, this is what he's saying to them. Uh, do not enter again. Don't think that the law will justify you. Meaning uh, don't think the law will make you right with God. Whatever it is that all the sins that you've committed has made you wrong with God and separated you from God uh, and you obeying the law and you following all the rituals and all the ceremonial laws. Uh, this is not going to justify you. You will not be a just man by following the law he's saying do not entangle yourself again he says stand fast in the liberty everybody say liberty in the liberty by which Christ Jesus has made us free do not be entangled again by this yoke but instead be free don't re-enter that mindset now how many Jewish believers are here previous Jewish believers are here none Right? And so you and I were not previously Jewish, but you and I were previously sinners. We were previously lost. We were previously dead in our sin, as the scriptures teaches us, uh, which brings us back to our opening text. Let's read again, John 8, 11. Here the Bible says, she says, no one, Lord, and Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Now we... We know the context of the story. We know what's happening here. There is a woman, uh, the Bible says she was caught, oh, I feel sorry for her, caught in the very act of adultery. So here she is getting her groove on with the wrong person, and the Pharisees caught her, dragged her, as we see in the movies, to the middle of the street somewhere, and so they bring her to Jesus, and they say uh, they want to test Jesus to see if Jesus will keep the law the way they want to. They want to test God in the act. And so they're, here they are, they're trying to test Jesus. Uh, and Jesus responds to him, uh, something that you and I understand to be so powerful. Uh, he says, uh, he who is without sin cast the first stone. We knew the, we knew the punishment for her sin uh, was going to be death by stoning. And so what uh, he says, uh, the, 
all of you guys that are trying to point fingers at this lady, the first of you that's without sin cast the first stone. That's what I want you to do. And they looked at each other in their hypocrisy, and they said, well, <laughs> that's not me. I'm out of here. And so now we get to our text, and Jesus and this woman are having this conversation, and this is a picture of God's grace. So this is a picture uh, of God's ways being higher than our ways. Can you say amen? Uh, her accusers have left her, uh, and Jesus is looking at her and telling her, where are those who accuse you? Um, he says, neither do I. I'm not here to point fingers. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to accuse you. I'm setting you free. However, go and sin no more. I'm not going to condemn you. Uh, in fact, I've dealt with those who wanted to condemn you. I'm going to set you free from a state of condemnation. How many know Romans 8 verse 1? Uh, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, here he is. Uh, this woman is about to be condemned for her sin. Uh, we understand she was wrong. We understand that there's truth. Uh, we understand we need to call her out. Uh, but Jesus is saying, yes, you were wrong. But I'm not going to condemn you. Uh, but go and sin no more. I drew a line I told all of your accusers uh, that if they've never sinned before that they can stone you I've taken care of your oppressors uh, I'm personally here with you one-on-one -on -one. I love you I care for you I want to forgive you I have forgiven you I'm letting you know that I'm setting you free but under one condition go and sin no more and so I want you to consider with me go and sin no more in other words your freedom is for a righteous purpose your freedom tonight is for a righteous purpose. I, I haven't even given you the title of my sermon. Free for righteousness. Your liberty in Christ is for a righteous purpose. There are people in this room right now tonight who are previous murderers, drug dealers, thieves, fornicators, uh, and we all deserve hellfire. We all deserve the wrath of God, uh, but thank God for Jesus. Can you say amen? Uh, however, a big issue I've noticed in Christians over the years uh, is not knowing what to do with their freedom. Here we are, we've sinned, we're guilty, we've done, we lived our lives in sin. Uh, God has accepted us, forgiven us, uh, and we found tremendous freedom in Christ in our own way. Maybe different than a Jewish man, but we found freedom from our sin. Uh, we now have the power in Christ Jesus to say no to temptation. We found freedom. Uh, we found freedom in our mind in all these different ways. Uh, but a lot of the things, uh, a lot of the times I'm noticing is Christians don't know what to do with their freedom. Your freedom is for righteousness sake. You are free. God frees us, uh, but for a purpose. Uh, he frees you so that you can live for him. He frees you so that you can do what's right. Your freedom is for righteousness. I'm setting you free from this state of condemnation. Uh, I've dealt with your oppressors, uh, but go and sin no more. Your freedom is so that you might live righteously, uh, that you might live holy. I remember being in the world before I got saved, and every single Friday, my wife can tell you, um, every single Friday, we did the same thing. We're in the studio, we're getting high, we're getting drunk, we had girls around and different things, and that's kind of the, the life that I lived Friday after Friday after Friday, and, uh, you know, when I got saved, how many know I freed up my Fridays, God freed up my Fridays. And now I replace that with Bible studies, right? My freedom is for righteousness, righteousness sake. I've replaced something that I used to do that wasn't pleasing God, that wasn't righteous. So, and now I've inserted something that is righteous. Go and sin no more. We can talk about the demoniac in Acts chapter, uh, Mark chapter 5. Listen to this, Mark chapter 5 verse 19. But Jesus said, go Go home to your family. He says, rather, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Now, think about this man. Demons are inside of him. 
This man is possessed by legions, the Bible says, of demons. Okay, he's living in the cemetery. He's living with pigs. He's cutting himself. The Bible describes that no one can bind him. This man is completely controlled by different spirits. He's controlled by these demons. He's cast off from society. And the Bible says that he sees Jesus from afar off and he runs to Jesus. And what happens, friends? Jesus delivers him. But in his delivery, there was a condition, there was a command after his delivery. Um, he goes to Jesus, Jesus delivers him. And listen to this, a man who was once broken is now whole. A man who was once lost is now found, confused, now has clarity, bound, but is now free. Um, but there is an expectation to his freedom. Um, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you. In other words, you're no longer in a cemetery, but I have an expectation of you to do something with your freedom. You can't just lay around and watch Netflix all day. You can't just lay around and party all day. You can't just chill. You can't just be lazy. You can't just be a sloth. But no, there is an expectation. I've set you free. Go home to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. Tell everyone that you come across how merciful God is. There is an expectation for your freedom that we should do something. Now that we're free, we should do something that is righteous. We're freed for righteousness sake. What about Luke? Think about me about the 10 lepers who were healed. Luke 17, 15 to 17. The Bible says one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God. Think about this story. It's crazy. Jesus heals 10 lepers. All 10 of them were healed, but only one came back to give thanks. I want you to consider this in the context of this sermon. He came back praising God in a loud voice, verse 16. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, thanked him. He, he was a Samaritan, the Bible says. We all know the beef that Jews had in Samaritans. It's like Jews are bloods and Samaritans were crips. And so the Bible says, Jesus asks, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Listen to this. These ten dutty lepers were cleansed. They were freed from their disease. Come on, somebody. They were freed from their condition. And you know what? Here that only one of them does what's expected of him. And that is to do what is righteous. And sometimes doing what is righteous is just saying, thank you, God. Thank you. I praise you for cleansing me. I praise you for, for, for cleansing me, for making me new. I thank you. I praise you for delivering me. I praise you for freedom. There is an expectation. Jesus is, like, Jesus is thinking about the other nine that did nothing with their freedom. And he's like, this is wicked. This is wrong. Where, where, are, these, where are the other nine? But only one of them used their freedom. For righteousness sake. And so it's clear. We see it's clear that sh the freedom comes in different shapes and forms in our lives. And we different. We might need it in different ways. I, I might need freedom in a different way than you might need freedom. We need it in different ways. We know that there's different types of freedom. But we all have uh, one thing in common. And that is that we've been, we've been freed from the shackles of sin in our lives. Uh, but here's what God wants to say to us today. Here's what God wants to say is that freedom is a test. Freedom is a test. In other words, what are you going to do with your freedom? What are you going to do? Now that you're free, what are you going to do with your freedom? It's like power. We know power is good. But how many know this is where we get the term abuse of power? You have obtained power, but now you can use it for good or you can abuse power. It's the same thing. God can set you free, but what will you do with your freedom? Will you use it for righteousness sake? Will you do the right thing? Some Christians can't wait for Sunday or Wednesday to pass because Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays are off days for them. Oh, I'm preaching now. And now, that, uh, there's nothing scheduled. They're in a spiritual vacation. It's just, oh, it's just a day for myself, and I can just chill, and I can just do my own thing. Oh, my gosh, I can't wait for Sunday to pass. And listen, I'm telling you, man, I can just chill. I can just 
read a little bit of my Bible, pray maybe for 10 minutes, uh, go to work and just spend the rest of my day watching Netflix or something like that. Using their freedom for laziness is not a righteous act. How many know when we're off church, it's not a spiritual vacation day. It's not an off day. Just because there's nothing scheduled on the calendar doesn't mean we can't be kingdom active. It doesn't mean we can't worship. It doesn't mean we can't hear preaching. It doesn't mean we can't do anything to edify ourselves or to even help edify others. It doesn't mean that it's a, it's a day off. Or, oh, just because there's nothing on the church schedule, now it's a day for me. No, 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 no. That is not what God intended, 1 Peter 2, verse 16. For you are free, yet you are God's slave. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. And I've seen this at work in people's lives, uh, hindering uh, and, and, and hindering their growth. Now, you know, where they, they should be here, and now they're here, they're down low. Uh, why? Because every time we're not together, every time there isn't something purposefully, uh, you know, scheduled, uh, it's like, man, what happened to you? It's like you, you, sh you should be a spiritual giant, but you're, you're not. You're spiritually anemic. How many know Christians should have no days off? The call to follow Jesus is not a Sunday and Wednesday thing. Can you say amen? And I'm, I'm not saying you can't have a job. I'm not saying you can't visit your auntie. I'm not saying you can't play with your kids. I, I love playing with my kids. I'm not, I'm not saying any of these things. But what I'm saying is we should never stop being mindful of the kingdom. Galatians 5.13. You were once called for freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Think about that. An opportunity for the flesh. What are we doing? What are we doing free, uh, feeding our flesh? Uh, feeding our flesh with whatever it is, worldly things, worldly entertainment. Uh, but, but be serving one another through love. Use your freedom to serve one another. Who are you serving? Who are you, who are you serving with your freedom, with your free time? Who are you serving? On your off days, it, does it cost your mind? To, let me call someone and encourage them. I, it's something, just, something just came to my mind, and this might not be relevant to my sermon, but many of you know, uh, many of you know that we've been praying as a church for uh, one of our members, uh, Sister Natalie, to have the baby and things to go well and whatnot. And the baby came about two weeks ago, but it's, a, a thought came to my mind about a week ago, and I said, I wonder how many people took time to call Natalie and say, congratulations on your baby. I just want you to know I'm praying. Even a text. Little things like that. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's like I, I didn't want to dwell on it because I didn't want anything to creep into my heart. But it was a thought, and I said, man, if this never happens, that's a very sad thing because we have people we have a lovely church with people that care, and she's, she's been a tremendous member that's added to our church. And I'm like, man, what people do, what, what you do with your free time goes a long way. As a church right now, we're reading a book on discipleship, and the, the author is talking about um, the importance of small group gatherings and how, how important it is to, to develop an atmosphere that's a family-like atmosphere where people are growing, people are being challenged, people are being encouraged. And one of the things that he's saying is that there is a small group and then there's a small group meeting, just like we're a church. But how many know we're still a church on Mondays and Tuesdays? And so we, we meet here on Sundays and Wednesdays and whatnot. And so he's saying what, what determines the success of the small, listen to this, what determines the success of the small group meetings is what people are applying on the days that you're not meeting. And so I, as I read that, it began to really add to this thought of this sermon that, man, what we do on off days is proof that what we do on Sundays and Wednesdays is working. Because if we're not able to be holy, if we're not able to live on fire for Jesus on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, days that we're not here, then something's wrong. That's exactly what the author was saying in the book of discipleship. Okay, if you're not reading, you got to start reading that book, guys. All right, I just wanted to throw that in there. But what do you do with your freedom on your days off? I was talking to a friend. Uh, 
good guy, you know, good Christian guy. He's come to the church a few years ago, four or five, four or five years ago. Uh, good brother. Um, and so um, here we are. Um, we're at his house. This was like less than a week ago. We're at his house in Toronto. We're hanging out. And um, he says to me, I'm going to get a tattoo. And so I, I say, I, what did I say? I say something along the lines of, it was one of three things. Um, don't be stupid. Or I said, don't be an idiot. Or I said, why? Right? Like with my face, like, why? Like, why? Why would you do that? Right? And so, and so anyways, um, that was my initial reaction. Um, but he was being serious. So initially I thought he was kidding, but uh, it was like 50-50. And so he was being serious. And so we got into the conversation. And so, uh, so here's the thing, right? It's like, is getting a tattoo a sin? Now, the, the, the text that every, every person that doesn't, hasn't really taken the time, I, I don't want to say doesn't know their Bibles, but hasn't really taken the time to study the context, there's a text in Leviticus that speaks about something like tattoos. But the context of that text, it's not speaking about what we do today as tattoos. It was a pagan practice, a pagan ritual. It, it, it's related to dead men and stuff like that. It's weird because we know tattoos didn't exist in those days. So I can't directly say to him, this is a sin. I, I don't have that authority. I don't know that. I, don't, I, I can't say that this is, this is a sin. And so the conversation went somewhere along these lines, like, yeah, it's not a sin, but here's what Paul says. All things are lawful, meaning all things are permissible. I can do all things, but here's the question, do all things edify? And so Christians oftentimes, they want to take their freedom and they want to run with it. Just because I can do this doesn't mean that I should do this. Can you say amen? And, 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 and this is, and, and, and again, like I said, my friend, he's, he's a good guy, but I'm just using this as an example. And this is where our conversation went, uh, is that, bro, just because something is permissible doesn't mean that you can go do it. Listen, for all we know, th there's no sin, actual sin, sin, and you being in a club. If, you're, if I go in a club right now and there's the lights are off, the lights are flashing, there's music, and I just stand there, am I sinning? People can argue that. But just because I'm allowed to do that, just because I have freedom in Christ, doesn't mean that's going to help me. And here's the difference between an immature Christian and the mature Christian. The mature Christian views edification as a righteous act. The immature Christian is viewing freedom as something that they can just all go off and do all the time. Remember what First Peter says, we're free, but we're slaves of God. We are slaves of God. And, and, and yeah, all things are allowed. First Corinthians 6 verse 12, I just want you to look at this verse. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me. But I will not be brought under the power of any. The other thing that Paul really mentioned is that, listen, it's not even just always about being edified. It's about being in bondage to certain things. Yeah, it's okay. I can do this. It's not a sin. It's lawful for me. In other words, I'm allowed to do this, but am I going to be in bondage to this? This was an issue for the Apostle Paul. And so you can go to the movies. There is no sin in that. As I said, you can probably go to the club. There's no sin in that. But is it going to edify you? Is it going to master you? That's, it. That's an issue. I have friends right now. Telegram has come out because, you know, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. And Facebook is coming with these policies. Oh, we want to read your messages. We want to advertise. We want to make money. Talk to Nemi for the specifics. He'll tell you. And so, um, and so, and so there are some people that are leaving WhatsApp. It's, it's not because Telegram is a better app. It's because WhatsApp has mastered them. It's like, oh, I spent too much time on WhatsApp. I, I spent too much time on this. They're, look, listen, there are a lot of things that are good, that are lawful, 
But the issue the Apostle Paul had, and I don't hear this spoken of a lot. Every time people quote the scripture, they say, oh, is it going to edify you? But that's not all he says. He says, I will not be brought under the power of anything. Paul was free to serve God because he didn't allow anything to master him. And I think a lot of times that's our issue. We got so much things mastering our lives that we, we go to God, we say, God, take, 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 take. And then by the time the worship service is over, we start taking it all back. <laughs> will you be free and will you use your freedom for righteousness? The song service team, please come to the platform. Amen.